Book Three, Chapter Ten. Early the next morning, the young Englishmen mounted their horses and took the road towards Baia. Glyndon left word at his hotel that if Signor Zanoni sought him, it was in the neighborhood of that once celebrated watering place of the ancients that he should be found. They passed by Viola's house, but Glyndon resisted the temptation of pausing there, and after threading the grotto of Pozzolipo, they wound by a circuitous route back into the suburbs of the city, and took the opposite road, which conducts to Portici and Pompeii. It was late at noon when they arrived at the former of these places. Here they halted to dine, for Merveille had heard much of the excellence of the macaroni at Portici, and Merveille was a bon vivant. They put up at an inn of very humble pretensions, and dined under an awning. Merveille was more than usually gay. He pressed the lacrima upon his friend, and conversed gaily. "'Well, my dear friend, we have foiled Signor Zanoni in one of his predictions at least. You will have no faith in him hereafter.' "'The ideas are come, not gone. Tush! If he be the soothsayer, you are not the Caesar. It is your vanity that makes you credulous.' Thank heaven I do not think myself of such importance that the operations of nature should be changed in order to frighten me. But why should the operations of nature be changed? There may be a deeper philosophy than we dream of, a philosophy that discovers the secrets of nature, but does not alter by penetrating its courses. Ah, you relapse into your heretical credulity. You seriously suppose Zanoni to be a prophet, a reader of the future, perhaps an associate of genie and spirits. Here the landlord, a little fat, oily fellow, came up with a fresh bottle of lacrima. He hoped their excellencies were pleased. He was most touched, touched to the heart, that they liked the macaroni. Were their excellencies going to Vesuvius? There was a slight eruption. They could not see it where they were, but it was pretty, and would be prettier still after sunset. "'A capital idea!' cried Merville. "'What say you, Glyndon?' "'I have not yet seen an eruption. I should like it much.' "'But is there no danger?' asked the prudent Merville. "'Oh, not at all. The mountain is very civil at present. It only plays a little, just to amuse their excellencies the English.' Well, order the horses and bring the bill. We will go before it is dark. Clarence, my friend, nunc est bibindum, but take care of the petty libero, which will scarce do for walking on lava. The bottle was finished, the bill paid, the gentlemen mounted, the landlord bowed, and they bent their way, in the cool of the delightful evening, towards Racina. The wine perhaps the excitement of his thoughts, animated Glyndon, whose unequal spirits were, at times, high and brilliant as those of a schoolboy released, and the laughter of the northern tourists sounded oft and merrily along the melancholy domains of buried cities. Hesperus had lighted his lamp amidst the rosy skies as they arrived at Racina. Here they quitted their horses and took mules and a guide. As the sky grew darker and more dark, the mountain fire burned with an intense luster. In various streaks and streamlets, the fountain of flame rolled down the dark summit, and the Englishmen began to feel increase upon them, as they ascended, that sensation of solemnity and awe which makes the very atmosphere that surrounds the giant of the plains of the antique Hades. It was night when, leaving the mules, they ascended on foot, accompanied by their guide and a peasant who bore a rude torch. Their guide was a conversable, garrulous fellow, like most of his country and his calling, and Merveille, who possessed a sociable temper, loved to amuse or to instruct himself on every incidental occasion. "'Ah, Excellency,' said the guide, "'your countrymen have a strong passion for the volcano. Long life to them, they bring us plenty of money. If our fortunes depended on the Neapolitans, we should starve. True, they have no curiosity, 
said Mervale. Do you remember, Glyndon, the contempt which that old count said to us? You will go to Vesuvius, I suppose. I have never been. Why should I go? You have cold, you have hunger, you have fatigue, you have danger, and all for nothing but to see fire, which looks just as well in a brazier as on a mountain. Ha ha, the old fellow was right. But, Excellency, said the guide, that is not all. Some cavaliers think to ascend the mountain without our help. I am sure they deserve to tumble into the crater. They must be bold fellows to go alone. You don't often find such. Sometimes among the French, signor. But the other night, I never was so frightened. I had been with an English party, and the lady had left a pocket-book on the mountain, where she had been sketching. She offered me a handsome sum to return for it, and bring it to her at Naples. So I went in the evening, I found it, sure enough, and was about to return when I saw a figure that seemed to emerge from the crater itself. The air there was so pestiferous that I could not have conceived a human creature could breathe it and live. I was so astounded that I stood still as a stone till the figure came over the hot ashes and stood before me, face to face. Santa Maria! What a head! What? Hideous? No, so beautiful, but so terrible. It had nothing human in its aspect. And what said the salamander? Nothing. It didn't even seem to perceive me, though I was near as I am to you. But its eyes seemed to emerge prying into the air. It passed by me quickly, and, walking across a stream of burning lava, soon vanished on the other side of the mountain. I was curious and foolhardy, and resolved to see if I could bear the atmosphere which this visitor had left. But though I did not advance within thirty yards of the spot at which he had first appeared, I was driven back by a vapour that well nigh stifled me. Cospetto, I have spat blood ever since. Now will I lay a wager that you fancy this fire king must be Zanoni, whispered Mervale, laughing. The little party had now arrived nearly at the summit of the mountain, and unspeakably grand was the spectacle on which they gazed. From the crater arose a vapour, intensely dark, that overspread the whole background of the heavens, in the center whereof rose a flame that assumed a form singularly beautiful. It might have been compared to a crest of gigantic feathers, the diadem of the mountain, high-arched and drooping downward, with the hues delicately shaded off, and the whole shifting and tremulous as the plumage on a warrior's helmet. The glare of the flame spread, luminous and crimson, over the dark and rugged ground on which they stood, and drew an innumerable variety of shadows from crag and hollow. An oppressive and sulphurous exhalation served to increase the gloomy and sublime terror of the place. But on turning from the mountain and towards the distant and unseen ocean, the contrast was wonderfully great. The heavens serene and blue, the stars still and calm, as the eyes of divine love. It was as if the realms of the opposing principles of evil and of good were brought in one view before the gaze of man. Glyndon, once more the enthusiast, the artist, was enchained and entranced by emotions vague and undefinable, half of delight and half of pain. Leaning on the shoulder of his friend, he gazed around him and heard with deepening awe the rumbling of the earth below, the wheels and voices of the ministry of nature in her darkest and most inscrutable recess. Suddenly, as a bomb from a shell, a huge stone was flung hundreds of yards up from the jaws of the crater, and falling with a mighty crash upon the rock below, split into ten thousand fragments, which bounded down the sides of the mountain, sparkling and groaning as they went. One of these, the largest fragment, struck the narrow space of soil between the Englishman and the guide, not three feet from the spot where the former stood. Mervale uttered an exclamation of terror, and Glyndon held his breath and shuddered. Diavolo! cried the guide. Descend, excellencies, descend! We have not a moment to lose. Follow me close. So saying, the guide and the peasant fled with as much swiftness as they were able to bring to bear. Mervale, ever more prompt and ready than his friend, imitated their example, and Glyndon, more confused than alarmed, followed close. 
but they had not gone many yards before, with a rushing and sudden blast, came from the crater an enormous volume of vapor. It pursued, it overtook, it overspread them. It swept the light from the heavens. All was abrupt and utter darkness, and through the gloom was heard the shout of the guide, already distant and lost in an instant amid the sound of the rushing gust and the groans of the earth beneath. Glyndon paused. He was separated from his friend, from the guide. He was alone with the darkness and the terror. The vapor rolled sullenly away. The form of the plumed fire was again dimly visible, and its struggling and perturbed reflection again shed a glow over the horrors of the path. Glyndon recovered himself and sped onward. Below, he heard the voice of Mervale calling on him, though he no longer saw his form. The sound served as a guide. Dizzy and breathless, he bounded forward, when hark, a sullen, slow, rolling sound in his ear. He halted and turned back to gaze. The fire had overflowed its course. It had opened itself a channel amidst the furrows of the mountain. The stream pursued him fast, fast, and the hot breath of the chasing and preternatural foe came closer and closer upon his cheek. He turned aside. He climbed desperately with hands and feet upon a crag that, to the right, broke the scathed and blasted level of the soil. The stream rolled beside and beneath him, and then, taking a sudden wind round the spot on which he stood, interposed its liquid fire, a broad and impassable barrier between his resting place and escape. There he stood, cut off from descent, and with no alternative but to retrace his steps towards the crater, and thence seek without guide or clue, some other pathway. For a moment, his courage left him. He cried in despair, and in that overstrained pitch of voice, which is never heard afar off, to the guide, to Mervale, to return to aid him. No answer came, and the Englishman, thus abandoned solely to his own resources, felt his spirit and energy rise against the danger. He turned back, and ventured as far towards the crater as the noxious exhalation would permit. Then, gazing below, carefully and deliberately, he chalked out for himself a path by which he trusted to shun the direction the fire stream had taken, and trod firmly and quickly over the crumbling and heated strata. He had proceeded about fifty yards when he halted abruptly. An unspeakable and unaccountable horror, not hitherto experienced amidst all his peril, came over him. He shook in every limb. His muscles refused his will. He felt, as it were, palsied and death-stricken. The horror, I say, was unaccountable, for the path seemed clear and safe. The fire, above and behind, burned clear and far, and beyond, the stars lent him their cheering guidance. No obstacle was visible, no danger seemed at hand. As thus, spellbound, and panic-stricken, he stood chained to the soil, his breast heaving, large drops rolling down his brow, and his eyes starting wildly from their sockets. He saw before him, at some distance, gradually shaping itself more and more distinctly to his gaze, a colossal shadow, a shadow that seemed partially borrowed from the human shape, but immeasurably above the human stature, vague, dark almost formless, and differing, he could not tell where or why, not only from the proportions, but also the limbs and outline of man. The glare of the volcano, that seemed to shrink and collapse from this gigantic and appalling apparition, nevertheless threw its light, redly and steadily, upon another shape that stood beside, quiet and motionless. And it was, perhaps, the contrast of these two things, the being and the shadow, that impressed the beholder with the difference between them, the man and the superhuman. It was but for a moment, nay, for a tenth part of the moment, that this sight was permitted to the wanderer. A second eddy of sulphurous vapors from the volcano, yet more rapidly, yet more densely than its predecessor, rolled over the mountain, and either the nature of the exhalation or the excess of his own dread, was such that Glyndon, 
after one wild gasp for breath, fell senseless on the earth.